I'd like to add my warm welcome to, to all the people who've returned. Um, it was a really interesting session. Um, great to see how much the region is doing and how the people, you know, all these countries and regions are working with organisations to really improve this. First, uh, just a very quick digression. First has a vision. That vision is, you know, teams around the world in every country working together to do good stuff and make the internet a better and safer place. And I thought this morning demonstrated the, the first one of our sort of missions in that, the global capacity coordination, knowing that there's someone else around the world you can talk to in every country. And that's really important to us. So that was really, really exciting. The first of these uh, sessions this afternoon very much focuses on the second mission that FIRST has, which is all about a common language. We talk about that as a common taxonomy and about a common understanding of what things mean, but it also means standards. It means standards where systems can talk to systems, where things can understand each other and we can do things much quicker, much faster and much more efficiently. So standards are very important to FIRST. We spend a lot of time with working on a couple and we're very interested in, in pursuing these. So I'm really interested to see this, this session going. John Robert, I, I look forward to hearing how it all goes. And, and John Robert, take it away. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chris. Uh, greeting again, colleagues. Uh, we've heard a lot of interesting uh, words uh, from the previous channel. And uh, 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 Chris just highlights uh, the need for common uh, language. Uh, we heard about capacity building, uh, incident response capacity, national and sectoral teams. Uh, cybersecurity incident response team, supply chain security, secure development, cyber defense center, trust building, point of contact, cyber exercise. A lot of jargon for building and maturing, maturing organizational arrangement capabilities and service portfolio. Uh, the purpose of this panel is to discuss emerging framework, standard and model applicable to incident response and security teams operation. Uh, FIRST has developed the C-shirt and the P-shirt service framework. SEI has released the sector C-shirt framework. And we have heard about the maturity assessment model SIM3. ITU has recently released XT1060. So what are these frameworks? Uh, we are fortunate to have chairs and speakers that have led the development of this framework and they have accepted to share with us their work. Don't hesitate to ask questions. On this note, I would like to introduce uh, Professor uh, Dr. Klaus-Peter Kosowski. Uh, he has more than 20 years of experience uh, in the field. He is the chair of the c -Cert Service Framework. And Professor Kosakowski has helped considerably to raise the awareness of CERT, concentrating on international issue, information sharing, and coordinated cooperation and establishing an interna international infrastructure for cyber defense. Uh, Professor, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. So thank you very much. And, uh... I hope this works and you can see my screen. I would like to share some thoughts about the CSERT services framework development, which we do within a special interest group within first since probably four years. And um, we are actually, after having published the most recent version of version 2.1 of the framework, moved on in defining the roles that you need inside your CSERTs to handle these services. Um, so actually, we got quite well support of the community, but also from the ITU to name one specific organization that helped us also to translate the common language we are trying to achieve into the natural languages we all use in our specific um, communities. And to make it better approachable, and I think this is the key, and this is also why I'd like to, to walk you through and welcome the chance to tell you what, what we are trying to do. So after some, some work, we finally, in November 2019, we uh, uh, offered the uh, uh, latest version. And the basic idea 
goes back actually to work I did with the SEI in 2003, where we tried to come up with a common set of services describing by name and referencing by, by functions the tasks that are typical for a CSER. And only more recently, in the mid of uh, 2010, 2011, the CSET community started to think about maturity. And we will hear later from a very good friend on Stickford later on what we do in regard to maturity. But it's important to realize that at the beginning, we don't have a maturity. We are trying to do our job. And to do our job, we need the capabilities, the means and the tools and the knowledge first, and then we are gaining more and more maturity. And over time, we will develop documentation and standard procedures and ways of training new team members. But actually, when, when I started my first CSERT in 93, I wasn't really concerned about maturity because I was concerned about getting the job done and understanding what my job is. And you need the capabilities for the jobs you need to do in your specific country, in your specific constituency, but also you need the capacity. And that's why it's so important to start with capacity and capability building, but don't forget the maturity. So we didn't try to come up with packages of services that describe a specific type of CSERT. And we all know that the national CSERT is certainly different of an internal organization focused CSERT in any bigger company. And we have coordinating CSERTs that overseeing other security teams and entities inside your organization, may it government or may it uh, on the commercial side, but you need to coordinate these actions, but necessarily you will not be available on site where the actual incident takes uh, off and where you need some malware analysts, for example, and uh, people addressing the technical issues. You're focusing more on the management of the incident. And suddenly we realize that this is in the future where we will need to come up with some um, blueprints for typical team types, but this is something we have not on the agenda right now. We are focusing more on what can be done, what should be done by a CSET and describing it by proper name. And now, as I said in the beginning, we're focusing on what kind of roles we need in the human part to get the job done. So the CSET services are divided in four, uh, sorry, five different areas which you recognize by name, certainly vulnerability management, which includes advisory and uh, event management, which is also typical for a SOC, but may be done by a CSET in combination. And the typical at the core, and that's why it's on the top, the security incident management, which is uh, in the name of a CSET already. The service areas are then divided in specific services, which we can identify and separate clearly. And then for the services to function, we need the functions that are uh, supported by tools, documented by standard operating procedures, and maybe subdivided into other sub functions. And you can find all that in the framework laying out the different services like we have in the vulnerability management section, for example, all activities coming from the discovery research over the intake of reports from other security researchers or other fellow CSERTs to the analysis, the coordination with the vendors and the development of remedies and patches and waiting for them to finally be able to release the information to our constituents and the general public to warn them about what new vulnerability there might be and alert them to the fact that they now need to apply those patches. And going from there, we are now in the step preparing the final draft for review within the first community and uh, to, by the public about roles which we 
attribute to each specific function. And we describe not only which roles are typically um, needed, but also how these roles should be defined in terms of the skill set competencies. And you see, this is uh, interesting because I just took the four typical roles from the incident um, security incident management area that you have an incident analyst, an incident responder, and the incident coordinator, which we all actually also call triage coordinator, because triage is the most critical skill a coordinator need to have. But if we look with a closely related service area like the event management, we clearly see overlaps in these roles, which means you can take benefit of this overlap by having people working also in service areas of the event management and also in the incident management, but you can also split the team if you have the workforce allowed and having the same skill set, the same competencies, but using them in different contexts, one on the one side for the event management and other teammates for the incident management side. So each role will be defined by a description where we set the context. And then we certainly need to lay out the general tasks, which are certainly um, important as well. But we are looking also for the specifics, the CSET specific functions and tasks. And that's why we go back to our CSET services framework. We reference the functions the role would contribute to always in reference to the version 2.1 of the CSET services framework, and then list all the general, generic and general competencies like communication or problem solving, uh, which are important also if you look at the skill set and what kind of people you look for to staff your teams. But then we move into the role specific competencies like threat analysis, which are important also for the future training and experience of the team mates that you would like to um, have in your team and the people you're actually looking for in your team. So I think this pretty much summarizes what the CSET services SIG is doing. And I would now like to hand over back to our kind moderator. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Kozakowski, uh, for this presentation on uh, CSERT service framework, how it applies to different uh, type of teams, the role that will be tremendously helpful in capacity building. Um, first, also build the PSERT service framework. Um, I would like to uh, introduce uh, Pete Allo. From, from Red Hat to talk to us about why, uh, in addition to this CSERT service framework, first uh, believes that it is important or found important to build also a PSERT service framework, what it is and uh, how we can apply it. So on a, on a quick note, uh, Peter Law is a director of Red Hat product security team where he has the responsibility for the portfolio of secure development through incident response. He is currently the chair of the first PSET SIG, where a number of documents supporting the product security incident response were developed by practitioner for practitioner, including a framework of service maturity and a base incident response plan. Uh, Pete, uh, over to you, please. Thank you, Jean Robert. Um, hopefully it's coming across full screen now. So um, the interesting way we, we do things at first is that we communicate and exchange a lot of information. And uh, early on, uh, as the first board and, and the first membership looked at the CSER services framework, and we made a lot of progress there. And uh, Dr. Peter, Klaus Peter is moving that forward to even farther refine that. Uh, we had a branch off, a fork, if you will, about what do we do with P-certs? You know, is it the same? 
So we took the framework that uh, the CSER services SIG had worked on, and we started to evaluate that for how does it work for products. And if you look at your secure development lifecycle, you can look at a lot of different versions. You'll see that product instant response is the last stage of an SDLC. And yet many of us had tenants of that, but we weren't doing that exactly. We were the final stage of that. As we looked at the c search services framework, we started to come to the realization that, well, it didn't fit what we were doing. So the question was, what are we doing? So that started the P-Search services, uh, started actually the P-Search special interest group uh, because it was one of these, this hasn't been described before. There's a couple of books written about it, but they are mostly written from an individual, how do I do a particular role within a P-Search as opposed to what do I do as the organization for the vendor? And if you look at it, we describe vendor quite a bit differently than many of you may. If you're producing code, you are a vendor. You may not commercially sell it, but the fact that you develop it requires you have to have a process to build it and secure it. And part of that process includes the need to respond because someone will find something somewhere because like all of humankind, mistakes are made. People copy things and they use something from upstream, from an open source repository, or even from a closed source. So what we did is we started this entire journey. We have participating, depending upon our event, up to 100 individuals, a little bit over 44 companies, like our last TC. We've held six of them now. The fact that we have this growing ten colloquial, like what you are doing, really shows the interest that the community has around serving its uh, ability to describe what we do and make sure others understand what that is. And quite frankly, make it easier for others to enter, lower the bar. So as we looked at the P-Search Services Framework and we looked at the C-Search Services Framework, we started to see similarities. We tried to do the same thing about service areas, services, functions, and sub-functions. So there's a similarity in our approach. And we think that we need to have that similarity between the two special interest groups because it helps set a foundation of the approach. But once we got past that, we started to go, wait a minute, other than the fact that we both use instant response and we're instant response teams, we're doing some different things. And I'll cover that in a minute. Our piece of services framework, uh, first one was in 2017. Uh, we did an upgrade in 2019. We're in the process of looking at doing another version upgrade 1.2 and become more iterative. Like the rest of you, uh, the COVID pandemic has really put a crimp in our meeting styles and how we do that. But we have produced some training videos and, and a maturity guide, and we look to further refine those. And then uh, we are looking at other uh, best practices and body of knowledge for everyone to gain from. So that's our history. What do we do? The key part is we're looking for active industry participants. And from our SIG, you do not need to be a first member. You need to be a P-cert. Now we do talk to some of the coordination centers, but they have to really define themselves as a coordination center. And they are included in some of our events, but not necessarily a core member of what we do. But our idea is let's help everyone understand what a P-cert does from a services framework down through the supporting uh, processes, best practice, and other uh, informational materials so that they can continue or grow in their practice. Now, I have to say, one of the things I learned in this entire journey is, even though I wrote the P-Search Services Framework as a major contributor and, and guiding the group, I changed jobs. I went over to another organization and I found that, well, I need to use the Services Framework and I had to go back and reread what I wrote. And I can tell you, there's a difference between what you wrote and what you read trying to employ it. So I, I encourage anyone who's doing this type of work to go try it, see what you wrote and see if it really works. Because what we did learn is that we needed additional documentation and that began into delivering on our uh, maturity assessment. So you can see what we've done is we've moved through these goals and we, we started producing maturity assessments. And, and Jean Robert will tell you, he helped to de develop a, a rather 
robust way of doing it, whereas we have also a simple way of doing it. But I also encourage you to look at some other things like a BSIM, which shows how a secure development works. Because if you don't have the secure development part of you in your organization, you're over here catching whatever happens and you never seem to move ahead. So we would ask that you would consider doing that as well. But the key for a peace services framework is it's a baseline, if you will, of a la carte services. We tried to list all the services that you could potentially look at for peace operations as part of your functions, as part of your mission. It doesn't mean that you do all those functions. Because as uh, Klaus Peter pointed out, there's a capability and there's a maturity and he talked about a capacity. And we likewise use those same terms and the capability is can you in fact do something? When you look at a maturity is really how well can you do it? And capacity is how many simultaneous operations can you do? Now we differ a little bit on that part of the definition, but I don't think it's a major difference. It's how we view the problem set and how we're trying to approach it and put it together. And too often, many people say, you have to have a full capacity with a high maturity and we'll worry about capability later. And it's like, no, you have to understand from a capability perspective. So when we look at that, uh, we start to break down, how do we take our work? Because for many years, we operated as one great big group and it worked fine for us. But as we matured as a SIG, we started to realize we had additional needs and we couldn't do it from one centralized group. So we started breaking down into working groups. Because of the pandemic, we've, we've shortened that down to three working groups, but basically we continue to work on our framework towards our 2.0 release. We're also doing maturity and supporting documents. And I'll talk about those because we talk about those in layers in a minute. We're looking at tooling because most of the time the tooling that is out there does not meet the need. In other words, it wasn't built to purpose. And as we look through all these different challenges of purpose, we're finding that we've all amended something. So now we're looking at how do we build something for a purpose that fits a vulnerability problem set. Notice the issue here is the incident is the vulnerability, not the vulnerability is an incident. And it's a small turn, but it has to do with where your focus is at. So we're taking uh, that tooling and the third party components and we're putting those together because they have a commonality of what we need to produce because the marketplace is both demanding and quite honestly, without knowing third party components in our own instant response process tooling, they have to work together because that is what we need to search vulnerabilities against, especially when you have things from elsewhere that you've incorporated. The incident coordination work group is an interesting work group in the fact that first took on the industry consortium for advancement of security internet or CASI, and that folded into the P search city. And so we have this group of vendors who have an NDA and they have a process that they've taken on top of their PCER process to work together. We look at that as a model for other groups to emulate. In fact, we're talking to a group about how they can join us and they are a regionally focused European concern that deal with certain technologies, operations technology specifically. We are encouraging groups like that to form and have a great trust. And the question is, how do we help them operate? So there's a slight flavor change there. We're not running our piece of education as a separate group, but we still have a lot of education responsibilities. So we're taking that in within our working groups to help develop that and put that forward. So when I talk about the piece of documents, I said there's three layers. And our first layer is really, what is the framework? It is the bones upon which we hang all of our, our uh, functions and our services on. And um, as we've gone through, we, for instance, we noted that as we bring in like the Akazi type groups, we don't have a function that adequately covers that. So we have tagged that as a gap and now we're writing to it. So you'll see that in, in the future versions coming out in 2022. Layer two is the supporting layer. That's maturity. In other words, how do you do a simple or a complex assessment of where you are vis-a-vis -vis what you think you need to be from your framework? When I moved over here to Red Hat, the first thing I did is I looked at it and I said, let's write our version for Red Hat of the P-Search Services framework. 
And we discovered a whole lot of gaps, things that we thought we were covering well, other areas we were covering uh, plenty, and it helped us form how do we move to an instant response plan. And the interesting part is I got, I changed jobs again, came to Red Hat, and I found out, hey, there's supporting documentation we're missing. Like, how do you write an instant response plan from a PCER perspective? So uh, over a year, I had to learn how to write that. And uh, now we're turning that back to the SIG for incorporation for others to use. In all these, they are examples. So we're trying to tell those who are more regulatory inclined, don't use this as a checklist. This is really, how do you go to the market and find what you need for your particular meal coming up? So we started in 2015, looking at the, what the CSER services did. We started in real work in 2016, and that really turned on to, we need to have a piece of TC, and then we realized this is where we need to do our work. And we started with about 40 people at the first TC, and now we're just over 100 in person. We went to a hybrid event uh, last year. We were the last event, it seemed like, for the year for almost all of us. And um, we found that the hybrid event worked very well. And we've continued to use hybrid now as we meet. So um, the fact that we can get more and more organizations joining, we still have people join this. It's not unusual. Like, for instance, we had two different organizations join the PCER effort. Um, and it's, it's not often you get two, but you know, what I'm trying to point to is we still are getting a good degree of people joining and want to contribute. The PCER services framework. Uh, one of the things is we're while we use the same terms, we're organized slightly different. We actually looked at the, at the CSER services framework. We looked at this cybersecurity framework. We looked at the UK cyber essentials and a few other things and said, wait a minute, how does this work? And then we looked at SDLC and said, well, no, we're not the SDLC. I mean, we acknowledge that we're connected, but we're not part of it. So we had to go through and rework it. And we actually redesigned ourselves like the CSER services uh, SIG did several times to find what actually was most appropriate. So we broke down our service areas into six. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but I do encourage you to go to the first website and look at them. And you can see the biggest thing in, in, in our organizational foundations, you have to figure out how you wanna operate, what you wanna be, in the, and you have all the normal things you have as a business. But the stakeholder ecosystem really became the key area because you have to know who you're serving. We're a service organization, we serve others. We help coordinate, we help move things through, we help people stay accountable, we help hold uh, to coordination, but that's the biggest area. And then you look at the ones in the center, it's really about what do we do? It's about discovery, it's about triage, it's about remediation, it's about disclosure. And discovery usually is coordination with someone. Triage is how do you look at and assess it, know who it affects within your organization, who you need to coordinate within and without, and here's your initial, I think this is the problem that we have to do. The vulnerability remediate, remediation is actually a continuation within engineering. Because here you have to work with both product managers and engineering managers and QE managers to go through and fix the problem and anything that's associated. And then you have to make sure that it works appropriately within the product or application that uh, it's within. And then you have to look at dependencies. And the dependencies are a huge part because many of us have dependencies from one product to another product to a third product. It's not unusual to see that in many larger vendors. And then disclosure. Disclosure is a morphing subject to us, but you know the question is how do you release as opposed to disclose? And so that's a concept that we're evaluating. And then of course, training and education are all about what do you need to do and start somebody here? And what do you need to do as you learn what you didn't do well? Retrospectives are very big for us because you lo usually look for a root cause analysis in both the code and your process. And then what do you do for your instant response? So there's usually three levels to that. The maturity, I think I've covered enough, but the key is that if you can't look at yourself from a maturity perspective, and put a mark on a wall of what you want to measure yourself against or what you want to become, you can't get there. And so maturity is our measure of ourselves. It's a self-assessment. And how do we do that in a consistent way that actually brings us 
to uh, accomplishing the task handed to us. Remember, we don't write our own mission. Our mission comes from our stakeholders. So we have to be able to tell them how well we're doing against that mission statement. We point this out for, for organizations who are um, learning about this so they don't have to learn all the things we learned the hard way over the past 20 years. Okay, so the big thing I'll ask you is, if you're writing something, if you're distributing something, if you're producing code, you've crossed into the land of need and peace or you have to have instant response. Almost every government uh, and regional concern, like in NISA will tell you, hey, you should be doing instant response for your products. So have something designated for that. And if you have a large enough population of products, have somebody that is their full-time job because they, they can't be swiveled off into, well, I'm building something. You, you have to have that separation of duty. You need somebody who's looking out for your organization to make sure that you're doing it right. And if you have any questions, you have anything you wanna contribute, we ask that you come join us because there's still lots to do. Thank you, Sean Robert. Uh, thank you very much, Pete. Uh, it's always a pleasure to listen to how you put the P-shirt work into perspective. Um, so Pete and uh, uh, Professor Kosarski outlined process, best practice, supporting document with regard to computer security and product security incident response. Uh, but they also mentioned about maturity and the ability to measure oneself against in a consistent manner. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, Don Stigvot. Uh, Don is uh, one of the pioneers of the internet in Europe. Uh, he recognized security as a concern uh, early around uh, 91, chair, uh, surfed, and also was the founding father of the Dutch national team and the European TFC third community. Uh, he became a first member in 92. Uh, he is uh, co-chair of the Traffic Light Protocol Working Group, uh, another uh, common language that FIRST is developing. Uh, the metric, participating in the metric and ethic working group. Uh, he wrote the handbook for computer security incident response team continue to support the global cybersecurity community through SQ, SQ, the company he founded. And uh, very important for the topic, Don created sim tree maturity model for CSERT. Uh, Don, over to you. Thank you very much, Jean-Aubert. That actually makes, makes it sound as if it's been around for quite a long time, which is probably true. By the way, the uh, handbook uh, for CSERTs was written together with Moira was Brown and Klaus Peter Kosakowski. So, uh, first, Africa CERT, thank you very much for the invite. Wonderful to be here. Wonderful to see over 90 participants. And of course, there are some people who I know for decades, like the two Peters and, and Chris and Serge, but um, also a lot of people who I may not have met yet and I hope to meet. And it shows me that there is a lot of interest in the frameworks that we are talking about here. And I think that that is a very good thing because it's important. Okay, without more text, let me see if my slides want to share. I think they do. So this is what I'm going to talk about here. And with thanks to not only FIRST and Africa CERT, but also the Open CERT Foundation, in which I am active, and cyber for dev who is uh, allowing me to talk here. Very short, some, some, some intros, what actually led to the thinking about CERT uh, maturity. First of all, and you can read this slide for, for yourself, it's a little bit of history of the, um, the CERT uh, community, which started around 1988, 1989. It is basically a structured mesh. So we have many types of teams. And if you look more towards the bottom of the slides, you see the name CERT there, of course, which is the original CERT, CERT CC, which is the one who gave the name to that. And then CCERT, NCC, CDC. But we also have teams and, and uh, Pete, Pete Aller has been talking about this just now, which we generally refer to as PCERTs, product security teams. We have ISACs, we have SOCs. 
And we have those all over the world and we have them on all sorts of levels. We have them on national levels, we have them on corporate levels. Um, it's, it's a complicated setup. There is of course some form of hierarchy, but it's not a very strict or formal hierarchy. That's not the way the internet works. And that's not the way the, uh, this community works. So on the right hand side, you see sort of a picture which indicates that if you have a lot of teams, you have even more. If you have actually N teams, you could end up with more than, with around N square connections. Um, and that's a lot. And that's what I refer to as a structured mesh. And how are you actually going to make this work? Well, we do. But next one, trust. Very simple uh, picture. Well, I guess I'm a mountaineer. And if you do mountaineering, uh, somebody has their microphone open. Could you please turn it off? Uh, thank you. In mountaineering, trust is essential. If you rope up with someone, you need to trust them. Um, trust is equally important in our community. Well, most of you know that, but those among our participants who are maybe new to this, this CSERT world, um, please listen, because trust is the one most important quality that is needed to make the system work. We also found in the, in the, uh, during the uh, uh, Corona crisis, that um, it's actually pretty hard to build trust with online meetings. If you know people already, it's fine. If you don't know people, how are you going to build these trust relationships? And without trust relationships, this system, this structured mesh that I was talking about, doesn't really work. So, okay, we have, we have this complicated system which has to world, work worldwide. And, and trust is a, is, a, is, a, is a basic factor in that. It's actually, I put those two here because back in 2007, it led me to thinking about um, the fact that we, that was 2007, that's a long time ago now, 14 years, uh, that we needed to introduce some kind of concept of maturity, which was quite common in other areas of life or work, but we didn't really talk about it back in 2007, or we just started talking about it. Of course, I discussed it with friends like uh, Klaus-Peter Kosakowski. Um, I, I remember some some very good talks in his, in his home where we actually started to draw up some of the basic concepts concepts of what is now SIM3. And uh, I actually wrote it down in 2008 and we piloted it in, in 2009 with quite a variety of teams in, um, in Europe. So that started to become a standard and actually uh, in 2010, it was picked up by the European CSERT community and they still use it today for certification, TI certification. There's some 30 or 40 teams that are currently uh, certified. Now in 2015, as part of an, uh, an international conference in The Hague, uh, we actually wrote down some attempt at uh, what, what maturity means. You can define this in many ways, but what we wrote down in 2015 was in the middle of the slide, an indication of how well a team governs, high level, documents, writes it down, performs and measures their function. All of that somehow part of, um, part of maturity. I'll come to Sim3 contents in a moment, of course. There was a C-Sort maturity kit written in, in the international context, um, which was based on SIM3. And then an important step, and it also goes back to what uh, Peter Kosakowski and uh, Pete Heller have just been talking about, is that we were developing this SIM3, and there was also the development of the services framework. And back in Seoul, and I'm pretty sure Pete Heller will remember, we actually sat down and said, okay, how are we actually going to make these, these two work together? And we came up with this model that is in the, in the slide here, and that still works today, where you can see SIM3 as sort of a, a baseline of security which is security of the organizational aspects, human aspects, tools and processes. I'll come to that in a moment. Um, and one part of this SIM3 broad maturity is the services that a team has, whether it's a C-shirt or a P-shirt, you need services. And that's where the services frameworks come in. Back then it was one framework, right now it's the C-shirt, first C-shirt services framework and the P-shirt services framework. Um, but in both cases, it's a very structured approach to what are you actually offering as services, in the case of CSERT, very clearly to your constituency. So you can see them as, as uh, perpendicular on each other. They actually work together very well. And this way of looking at it, I think, has served very well since 2016 and still does. Okay, well, now I'm talking about SIM3. What's it actually all about? So it means security incident management maturity model, MMM, that's M3. And very important is that it is a neutral model. So SIM3 doesn't really tell you how to do your work. It, it doesn't tell you how good you should be. It only gives you a number of parameters, 44. And these parameters span four categories. 
as you see on the slide, organization, human, tools, and processes. It gives you these 44 parameters. It gives you a measuring scale on the right hand side. I'll come to that. And then you can use that in any way you like. You can use it for membership criteria. You can use it for your own internal development. You can set your own standard. You can, for a community, you can make a standard, a baseline basically. But SIM3 doesn't tell you how to do that. This is up to you. So it's a neutral maturity model that does not prescribe. That's a very important concept. The measuring scale is the same for all the parameters. It has five maturity levels and they go from zero to four. It's basically a very simple scale. So if you apply it in real life, there is some complexity to it, but okay, zero, not available. One, it's implicit, it's between your ears. It's what people think and know, but they haven't written it down. So experts always have a lot of level one going on. They know how to do it, but they haven't written it down. Level two and three, it's written down. Level two means it's uh, more or less informally written down, like uh, wiki pages, etc. Level three, it is formalized by the uh, CSERT authority, the head of the CSERT. Level four is the interesting one because level four goes outside the CSERT boundary. Level four means that there is some kind of regular assessment going on by a higher governance level. The whole meaning of level four is to make sure that a communication is established between the higher governance level and the CSERT, which should lead to improvement of the CSERT. And that's why level four, for a number of parameters, doesn't have to be all 44, for sure not, but for a number of key parameters, it is really good to strive for level four. So that's basically SIM3. It's very simple. If you go to one of my long trainings, I can talk, talk to you about all the parameters, but that takes more time than I have now. You can then measure your team and there are online tools for that which every one of you can use right now and you get for all the 44 parameters which you see here on the outside of this uh, radar diagram you can you can get a measurement going from zero to four which is the concentric circles and then you get this kind of nice picture which is very nice to use in boardrooms uh, talking with your uh, with your higher management uh, etc and if you improve basically your your graph becomes wider you get a bigger surface area within the graph when your maturity grows okay what's going on right now um we have had a lot of development since 2016 the open CSERT foundation picked up sim3 from me basically uh which gives me a really good feeling because it means that at some some i also get older at some stage i can step out and sim3 is safe also trained sim3 auditors which is a very important concept for the uh, further development of sim3 our friends in Japan use SIM3 quite extensively for maturity development purposes. I saw Masato Terada among the people who are listening in here. He is actually a certified SIM3 auditor. Uh, ENISA applied it for national and sectoral teams in Europe to create three maturity profiles. They are called basic, intermediate, and advanced. And basically, this is a, an application of SIM3 where you say, okay, if you're a national team, you can, you can grow in maturity from basic to intermediate to advanced, and it gives you everything you need to know to do that. The, the GFCE found it such a useful idea that they actually globalized this ENISA SIM3 approach in what is called the Global CSERT Maturity Framework, or GCMF, a new version of last April. Uh, it become, SIM3 has become quite popular in Latin America, LACNIC, OES, Africa, Africa CERT, of course, just spoke Africa. Um, and while I'm speaking also on behalf of Cyber for Dev here, Cyber for Dev is a capacity, cyber security capacity building project, uh, which uh, works basically all over the world. And we use SIM3 there to help mostly national and sectoral teams develop their uh, maturity. First, with, together with OCF signed an MOU and first picked up SIM3 for the membership application process. And I'll show you what that looks like. Because if you go to the tool, which is, so by the way, you will get slides uh, afterwards. Uh, I, will, I will spread them. Um, you can apply the tool, which is currently there. It's the OCF tool versus also working on their own version. And on the right-hand side in the radar diagram, you actually see that first has taken 11 of the 44 parameters. Uh, and there are some minimum uh, values there. And this is the kind of system that is currently being introduced by first to make the process of new membership application uh, more structured. Um, and, and that's what SIM3 is being used for. Now, final slide. We are currently working on something quite exciting. 
um, which we call sim3 v2 code name it's basically next version of sim3 well we want to keep backwards compatibility as much as possible because so many people all over the world are using this standard uh, but you need to understand that sim3 was basically designed for any kind of c cert whether you call them cert or ncc or cdc and has proven to work very well for those on all continents you can use it or part of it for pcert for i6 and soc but it's not an ideal fit so what we're working on right now is actually we have already worked together with the nissan from ocf that is on an uh, updated draft which is still focusing on c-cert which has basically bringing it up to date and 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 doing various improvements but the more exciting work will still happen because in the course of the coming year we will actually expand sim3 to work for p-certs i6 and socks and they are all a little different right there, there are lots of similarities, but I like, like Pete Aller argued, the PCR is just a little different. Uh, we will continue to issue more language versions. We started with that, uh, improve the online tool, and very important, anyone who wants to use the SIM3 for internal use, for first use, for Africa search use, for not-for-profit use, everyone is free. If you really want to make a profit on using it, then I would say talk to OCF and see how you can contribute to the development. Uh, and training of SIM3 audit is a key component in uh, the uh, sust sustainability strategy that we have for SIM3 and SIM3 uh, V2. So that was uh, what I wanted to share with you. I hope it was useful. Thanks for joining me in there. Charles Aubert? Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Dom. Uh, it's always a pleasure of having you. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your, your experience and your passion for maturity measurement with us. Uh, in the three previous talk, we've heard about national CSIRT, sectorial CSIRT. Uh, early this year, uh, SEA has released the CSIRT, the sector CSIRT framework. Um, I would like to invite Justin Novak to talk to us about why uh, SEI believe that uh, having a C-Cert service framework is relevant and what it is. Uh, Justin is a senior security operation researcher at the third division of the Software Engineering Institute, a federally funded research and development center hosted at Carnegie Mellon University. At CERT, he is involved in research on the operation of CSERT, sector CSERT, and security operation centers, focusing on incident response and incident management. Justin, over to you. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Jean Robert. Uh, let me. <clears throat> okay, hopefully the slides are showing. Um, again, thank you, Jean Robert, for the introduction, and uh, thank you. Uh, to all the hosts and to FIRST for uh, organizing this event and putting together this, this really outstanding panel. Um, I don't have that many slides, so I'm just going to uh, talk a little bit about the sector CSERT framework, um, a little bit about why we developed it, um, what is in it. <clears throat> and then I just wanted to mention one or two kind of key aspects of the, the sector CSERT framework. Um, that we think are, are really important and really relevant to the discussion that we've had so far today, um, uh, particularly with what uh, some of the panelists here in, in this panel have talked about, uh, but also in the previous panel that talked about some of the cooperative type of efforts, uh, international and regional efforts, and hopefully we'll start to see how everything kind of fits together. Um, so in any case, as Jean Robert said, we published this sector C certs framework uh, earlier this year. Now it's it's been something that we've been working on really for the last couple of years, trying to get our our heads wrapped around how is a sector C cert different than some of the other C certs that that we see. I think we talk about national C certs a lot. You also hear a, a lot of talk about. C certs in the private sector, um, things like P certs, uh, you know, those types of organizations. Um, but we also know that a lot of countries and a lot of economies also deploy C certs that are specific to a particular sector of the economy, or what we call sector C certs. So we wanted to capture 
what makes those organizations different uh, and, and what the special and unique needs of those organizations are. And we kind of went back to a, a really um, old, <laughs> it's old at this point document that you've, you've already heard mentioned once in, in this session. Um, and that is the, um, the handbook for creating C-certs, which was uh, co-authored by a, a couple people who are on this panel. I, I know, I think Don uh, Stickfort and Klaus Peter were also part of that effort. Uh, and then some of my colleagues here at the SEI um, but that document, I think the most recent version was published in 2003, and it's still an incredibly important resource for the community uh, and an incredibly relevant document, uh, particularly for something that's almost 20 years old. Um, but as we had been working over the last few years and encountering a, a lot of people who wanted to develop sector c certs what we realized is that not so much that, that the CSERS handbook was not adequate, but that we needed to build on it and add to it to look at the specific um, case or, or the unique characteristics of a sector CSER. Um, so we partnered with uh, some of our sponsors at the US Department of State. Uh, I know Elizabeth Fish was uh, on one of the prior panels. Uh, Elizabeth and, and her uh, team at the US Department of State were incredibly supportive. Um, of us putting this document together. Uh, so we thank them. Uh, we also talked to so, some of our colleagues in the first community. So we appreciate all of those contributions. Um, and at the end, what we have is a document that I think really captures all of the unique um, needs of, of that sector, sector CSER. So let me jump into um, <clears throat> so some of the key aspects of the framework itself. So the first thing that we wanted to understand is what exactly is a sector CSERT? You know, what is a sector and what makes it different than other types of CSERTs that you see, other types of CSERTs that are out there, like a peace cert, uh, like a national CSERT. So we started by coming up with some definitions. We defined what a sector is. A sector is just a particular piece of a national economy. Um, that only focuses or, or only includes particular operators, whether they be a critical infrastructure operator or just a, a non-critical um, sector. Um, but in order to be part of that sector, you have to have some stake in the success of that sector for a given economy or for a given country. So once we kind of had an understanding of what we meant when we were using the word sector, we set about defining a sector CSER. So the sector CSER, what it really comes down to is the functions. And I, I know that may seem a, a little odd, but we didn't define it by saying, here is what we think a sector CSER is. Here's a description of a sector CSER. We define it by saying, these are the functions that a sector CSER should do. And if your CSER is doing these functions for a particular sector, then you have a sector CSER. So it, it really is a similar approach to what you see for maybe the um, CSERT services framework or, or even the PSERT services framework that really talk about uh, services or functions. We used kind of a similar approach here for the sector CSERT framework. So what we came up with is that a sector CSERT <clears throat> will perform vital tasks that are in service of a particular sector of responsibility but not for any other sectors. So these services or tasks can be instant response. Um, communication and coordination is often one of the most common services that a sector CSER may offer. Um, hosting discussions, bringing stakeholders together, um, particularly if you, you don't have a, a lot of history of communication or cooperation or things like that. And then a really important function of a sector CSERT is building trust and confidentiality among members. Uh, I think um, that was highlighted in the discussion about PSERT, um, you know, the, the need for trust and, and things like that. This is also really important in the sector community because oftentimes you have stakeholders who may be business competitors, but they have to work together on incident response 
uh, in order for everyone to be successful, in order to have sort of that, that shared security um, that you hoped at, to achieve um, with a sector CSER. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> so once we had those sort of definitions laid out, we, we sat down and got to work on building this framework. And what we wanted to achieve was a tool that would help build sector C certs or build capacity for sector C certs. And I'll get into that here in just another minute. Um, but, but before we do, um, our overarching purpose for the sector C cert framework was to help build sector C certs, but also to integrate them into what we call the national cybersecurity ecosystem. I'll discuss that in great detail a little bit later because thinking about that national ecosystem is a really important part of what this framework does uh, and a really important part of why we put this framework together. But the national cybersecurity ecosystem is just a, a way to describe all of those stakeholders across, or, or, uh, yeah, across a country that have some important role to play in cybersecurity. So this includes the sector C certs, but also includes um, private companies, law enforcement, a national C cert, um, possibly a national cyber coordination center. You can inclu include a lot of other stakeholders. And if you have a sector C cert, it's great to have a functional and capable team, but it's even better if that functional and capable team integrates with the, the rest of that ecosystem and can really share across sectors and, and sort of build on any success that it has within the sector. One other thing I wanna mention here at this point is that we do use in this document the term sector CSER, but the framework itself um, is developed and written in such a way that it is broadly applicable to any organization that is responsible for incident response, incident management, or coordination and communication across one of those sectors. So this could be something like an ISAC, uh, it could be a, a SOC, uh, a sector-based cybersecurity center or a coordination center. So we do use the term sector CSERT, but we also use the term sector-based incident response capability. Um, and we use that, that later term um, just to be a little more broad and encompassing of all the different forms that sector incident response can take. Uh, again, including ISACs, SOCs, all of those different organizations. So we feel that this framework is applicable to all of those different organizations. Um, so we hope if, if you're using a slightly different model, you might still be able to use this resource. Okay, so getting into the framework a little bit, um, what, when we were putting this together, again, we wanted this primarily to be relevant to and applicable to teams that are sitting down and thinking about how do I develop a sector CSERT or how do I improve the capability of a sector CSERT. So throughout the framework, throughout the document, you'll see the term development team. And what we mean by development team is just that group or organization which is leading the effort to develop that sector CSERT or that sector incident response capability. Now, there could be a, a lot of different things. Um, oftentimes, the development team is led by a national CSERT. Um, maybe it's being led by an industry organization uh, or, or a small group of stakeholders within um, a particular sector. So it could be a couple of different things, but that development team is really the audience for this document. And really the purpose of the document, again, is to help you develop those sector CSERTs and improve those capabilities. Broadly, the framework is, is broken into these six steps. Uh, there are a few other pieces in there and, and a lot of resources and different information that can help you in this mission, in this process of developing a sector CSERT framework. Um, but the document itself is broken into these six steps. Step one is satisfying the prerequisites. Prerequisites are all of the questions that you really need to think about before you can dive into the process. Because if you haven't at least thought about these questions, you're gonna have trouble later on. We do emphasize that you don't need to have answers, but you need to have thought about them because you need to know where you're going to go to get the answers. So prerequisites are things like 
Think about how are you going to fund the sector CSERT? Think about where the sector CSERT is going to be hosted. What is the definition of, of the particular sector and who are all of the stakeholders in that sector in your country or in your economy? These are things that, that would be different or might change from country to country, from economy to economy. So you have to be thinking about those things and at least, again, know where you're going to go to get the answers you're looking for. That leads you into step two, which is gathering information. Here's where you actually go out and start to answer some of those questions, but also start to engage with all of the stakeholders and all the community members to understand what their needs are, what their expectations would be for a sector CSERT, what services they might expect that sector CSERT to provide, um, what level of service or quality of service they might be expected to provide, um, how much interaction they might, they might expect to have with it. So you gather as much information as you can uh, from all the stakeholders. And then in step three, you organize that information and you start to evaluate where the gaps are. Now, throughout the framework, we talk about two states, the as-is state and the to-be state. The as-is state is where you start off where you currently are, and the to be state is your desired end state for your sector CSERT. What do you want it to provide? How capable do you want it to be? How engaged do you want it to be with the community? In step three, what you're doing is you're taking the information you've gathered and trying to understand where the gaps are between your as is state and your to be state. In step four, you simply build a roadmap to get from as is to to be. We have a lot of resources in step four about how to build a roadmap, what it should include, um, and how you might start to think about um, implementing it. And then that, of course, leads into step five, which is implementing that roadmap and planning and actually building your sector CSERT. This is often where we see countries and teams get tripped up. We see development teams kind of get stuck on this part of the process because this is the really challenging part. This is where the rubber meets the road and you have to actually start developing a team. You have to get people on board. You have to build that trust. You have to get buy-in from all your stakeholders um, so you can actually start implementing things, make policy changes, you know, sign actual agreements, and start information flowing in your sector CSERP. And then finally, step six is conduct post-implementation activities. This is using metrics, conducting lessons learned, and preparing for, a next, for another cycle where you may improve your sector CSERT's functions or capabilities uh, in the next round of development. The last thing I just wanted to emphasize here is again, circling back to that idea of understanding the national cybersecurity ecosystem and its importance to your sector CSERT or to uh, building a sector-based incident response capability. And again, the national cybersecurity ecosystem, that's just a term we use to describe all of the entities and all the stakeholders who have some stake in cybersecurity for your country, national CSERT, law enforcement, uh, regulatory bodies, the private sector, academia, all of these different people are really important parts of that national cybersecurity ecosystem. And when it comes to integrating your sector CSERT, there are two really important topics that we address in this framework um, that are, are critical considerations. The first is understanding the role of the national CSERT. Um, and there are different cases here. If you have a strong, capable national CSERT, um, if you have a nascent national CSERT, or if you don't have a national CSERT at all. And those, you, the ability to which, or the ability to which you can integrate the sector CSERT into that national ecosystem often depends on the state of your national CSERT because it's such a critical body um, for maintaining those relationships between sectors and the rest of the ecosystem. So you have to understand that and understand that role. And then the second piece here is establishing trust. Again, we've heard about establishing trust already today. I just wanna reemphasize that it's critically important when you're taking different stakeholders and different people from different parts of an economy and trying to get them to work together towards a common goal of cybersecurity, um, you have to be able to establish trust. So we have some ways to do that um, here in, in the framework and some resources. Um, so again, that's all part of integrating into that very important national cybersecurity ecosystem. 
Uh, so that's the framework. Um, I'll post a, a link to the resource itself um, in the chat. But uh, thank you, Jean Robert, and thank you to the rest of the panel. Um, I guess I'll take any questions or, or turn it back over to you, Jean Robert. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Justin. What is awesome is that you just answer some of the questions and concerns that are happening within national uh, framework and uh, a lot of discussion over what is the national research, what is the sectoral research, should we start a national research, a lot of uh, agency competition and et cetera. And uh, I would like also to point out uh, uh, Mr. Sadawi introduction speech, uh, where he outlined the national ecosystem of CSER in Tunisia. And I'm sure that there are many related engagement uh, within the African ecosystem. So uh, thank you very much. Um, so we heard about uh, the CSER service framework, the PSER service framework. The sectorial framework, maturity. Um, early this year, also, if my memory serves me well, uh, ITU put forward, uh, basically, ITUT put forward a recommendation X10 system. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Mwende Mijirani, the former chair of ITUT study group. Group 17, Security Regional Group for Africa, and the current chair, uh, Ricky Asayer, uh, to talk to us a little bit about uh, that uh, new coming framework and how it fit into the whole picture. Thank you. Over to you, uh, Raki and Wendy. Yes, uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone. I trust you can hear me. Um, yeah, okay. So I'll go straight into um, um, uh, what I will describe to you is the journey that we have had as uh, ITU, Regional Group for Africa. Uh, my colleague uh, Rake is not able to join us today, but what we have worked on as the Regional Group for Africa is try, which is an ITUT study group 17, which does standardization in security uh, so of telecommunication networks, is that we have uh, looked at a just recently uh, approved standard, which is X1060. And X1060 is a framework for establishment and creation and operation of a cyber defense center. So this was particularly, um, you know, um, came at the very right time, um, given that uh, you know, most of um, the world went into online interactions, whether it was in Africa or other parts of the world. And indeed, the issue of cybersecurity was very critical for all of us. So uh, we looked at uh, X1060 because X1060 as a recommendation gives um, all the services that a SAT should have. So if a SAT um, then looks at all the services that are in the recommendation, then indeed they would, uh, and some of the services which have had my colleagues who have just presented are in the framework, uh, the X1060 recommendation. So the X1060 recommendation, we looked at it and um, indeed, um, addresses uh, various resolutions under the ITU. There's uh, resolution 50, which deals with cybersecurity. There's uh, resolution 54, which uh, most of the organizations here have supported in terms of creation uh, of an assistance to regional, uh, to, sorry, that is resolution 44 is actually the creation of uh, regional uh, groups, uh, and it is uh, very exciting. Um, in the initial panel, we had uh, Dr. Badril, and we have interacted with Dr. Badril in um, because uh, Oman uh, had a contribution in ITU study group 17 on um, SAT assessments. And indeed, uh, what we are trying to do is actually the work that uh, uh, Dr. Badril and his team in Oman um, had tried to do. And we have continued with that work as the regional group for Africa 
actually we did have a meeting in Tunis in April of 2019, and that's where the collaboration has continued uh, with the Arab states and as well as the African states. So under resolution 44 is uh, bridging the standardization gap. And we have interacted with X1060, and I believe it is uh, Professor Klaus Peter who mentioned, or I'm not sure who mentioned before me, that there's one thing about developing a framework, but there's another thing developing the act actually implementing. So once we started looking at X1060, um, you know, we were told, okay, read it. So we are trying to read it. So we read it. Uh, because the person who wrote it is not the same person who implements it. So what we're trying to do as the regional group for Africa is implement uh, X1060. And indeed, uh, that will tie into resolution 54, 58, sorry, of uh, WTSA or the World Telecommunication Standardization Assembly, uh, which is encouraging the national, I mean, creation of national uh, incidents response teams. So on that basis, um, we have, uh, thank you, Grace. Uh, Grace will display, uh, we had, um, we have had meetings um, uh, first informally during the study group uh, meetings, uh, the whole of 2020 and beginning of 2021. The last meeting being uh, in September. Uh, August, September, and in the September meeting, we uh, decided of uh, study group 17, we decided to have an e-meeting of the regional group for Africa. And what is uh, displayed on your screen now is a tutorial that was given to the group, uh, which happened at the Africa Telecommunications Union meeting, uh, which was a preparatory meeting for the World Standardization Assembly, which is taking place uh, next year, I believe. Um, hopefully it will happen in Geneva. And uh, just going on um, um, to, to the next slide uh, is just uh, what the framework is, the scope and um, just moving on quickly, of course, there has been, you know, definition of, of who we are targeting, which is the CISOs and CSOs. And it's important for any standard to have a definition. And a CDC, in, as defined by X1060, is an entity within an organization that offers security services to manage cybersecurity risks to its business and activities. So it doesn't really um, limit that to just uh, SATs or national SATs, which uh, is really a big focus, especially in Africa, but it uh, focuses on anybody that is offering services, security services, as we mentioned, there's PSATs, the sectorial SATs, and etc. So what uh, we are looking at is the CSO being able to uh, empower and support the CDC as in the sense that whether it is a team, whether it is um, you know, a department, whether it's a group of two people, um, and therefore assign assign you know assign responsibilities um, define what are the security functions and then we'll cover in more detail what the framework covers in terms of the CDC services and um, the basis of course of the CDC services that a CDC will select is on the basis of the policy or the business objectives of the organization so moving on uh, CDC as an organization um, is just uh, uh, the same, you know, um, uh, I mean, well, <laughs> the picture is kind of the same, but in terms of uh, the CISO, we need to commit to the business objectives of the organization and on the basis of that, then define what are the security controls, which are based on the uh, business objectives, um, and then also, you know, to manage the cyber risks that the organization may face. So the CDC is empowered by the CISO to define, as we have said, then the security services. And I'll just move on quickly to, if we can move on. So as I've just said that the CDC is a broader, uh, I mean, concept, as we've just said, whether it's, whether it's a national SAT, a security operations center in an organization, or the group or the committee that has been formed within an organization to protect it, its business functions from cyber um, risks and therefore manage cyber incidences. 
Um, so the framework, um, as has been said, is the framework for creation and operation of a cyber defense center. Uh, and this was passed as a recommendation in, in April of uh, this year, 2021. And therefore we as uh, the regional group for Africa are trying to implement it and uh, reaching out to uh, reaching out to CDCs in Africa. We have had sessions where we have spoken, whether to forums or associations uh, within our region to kind of promote, uh, the, you know, have an understanding of what is uh, the standardization process that uh, to come up to with standards, basically what, how does the IT function? And um, after, you know, understanding what, how the IT functions and specifically study group 17 in terms of security, uh, what are the, you know, working parties, you know, just the structure and what um, individual questions under study group 17 are addressing. So there are three, uh, the framework, this particular framework deals with, you know, three processes. There's a build management and evaluation, which has already been said maybe in, <laughs> earlier by my colleagues in other terms, but there is a service list uh, which is proposed or um, put into the recommendation. And on the basis of the service list, then a CDC can select a service catalog on the basis of course of its business activities, then develop a service profile and a service portfolio, which you can then put out and say, this is the service that I offer. And then uh, moving on, um, to the next uh, slide. Um, yes, this is, uh, uh, as I've just said. So you have the a whole catalog of, uh, sorry, a, a service list, which is quite large. Um, actually, the, the category of services is A to I. And then the first phase, of course, is based on a recommendation. You know, you can pick out certain services that you wish to provide as an organization. And then that is the first phase. Um, and then in terms of um, organization specific, you can then generate a service catalog and then go on to provide a service uh, profile and a service portfolio, which is specific to the, your organization. Um, it's very interesting that we have just had um, you know, the discussion of services, whether it's as is or to be, and the framework or the recommendation or the standard as, you know, is commonly referred to in many standard developing organization does provide uh, the opportunity for the CISO or CSO to, you know, categorize whether a service is available, you know, whether it's planned or, you know, not provided, whether it is, um, for example, it's basic standard or advanced, whether it's insourced, outsourced or unassigned. And it was very, you know, very um, encouraging to hear that Togo by itself and has its own nationals in uh, the national SAT. So for, for example, for themselves, they would be probably looking at how are uh, starting already providing, you know, services which are all insourced. So that is, uh, you know, as is would be, you know, they would probably have a score of uh, three and to be uh, working towards developing a, a service portfolio and uh, you know, the national SAT in Togo. So this is kind of the development that a SAT would go in, you know, a CDC, whether SAT or SOC or whatever team that is providing services within an organization would go through. So moving on. Um, so these are the service categories and they're quite a number. So we have A to I, uh, one of course is strategic. As has been said, cybersecurity is not just the technical part. There's the boardroom part where the, who are the decision makers providing the finances uh, or providing the personnel who have to deal with this. And then B is real-time analysis, deep analysis. So I would invite you to go on to, you know, the, the um, the IT website and you know download the recommendation which is now available in English and French and um, look at all the services as defined in the catalog I mean sorry in yeah in the service categories so each of these service category for example A has 13 number of services so a CDC can select one of the 13 
which it finds necessary to meet its objectives as an organization. And one important one that has been said again is uh, category I, which is active relationship with external parties. And that's where partnerships come in, collaboration, whether national or international collaboration. Um, so the next slide, I believe, is a very detailed uh, list of all the services, as has been mentioned. So we'll just pass by that because if you read, uh, take time to read the recommendation, all the services are listed there. And the idea is that you can select any one of the services under any one of the categories to provide depending on your organization's objectives, or even whether it's a national objectives that you have identified um, as a service being required. So, um, so as mentioned, this is the tutorial that has been given to, um, you know, participants at um, the Regional Group for Africa meeting on the 28th of September has also been presented to various forums in uh, you know, where we've had uh, a discussion with, uh, for example, um, you know, associations of cybersecurity. Um, we have had two sessions in Kenya um, and presented to them as a means to, at the end of the day, um, look at the survey that we are going to look at uh, later. So as I've uh, been said earlier by my colleagues, there is a way that you can decide that maybe the service is deemed as a necessary basic or advanced. So we'll move on. That's making the catalog now. You're in the process of making the catalog. And the next slide is the build process, which is phase two, making now the service profile and you know, determining whether you have insourced, outsourced, a combination of both in terms of provision of service or if it is unassigned. Then uh, moving on is I believe the um, making now the portfolio, as has been said, you can then rate yourself in terms of setting the target and scores depending according to assignment status, whether it is a plus five to a plus one, or one which is not applicable in the sense that you have decided not to implement uh, the service, whether it is insourced or outsourced. And then moving on is the management process, which has three phases. And you could decide at the very beginning, you know, um, in terms of the st strategic phase, uh, in terms of accountability, because indeed, you, as a security officer, you'd need to report to the management. Then in terms of operation, maintenance, introduction of the framework, and indeed that's where the work, somebody said just before me that that's where the rubber meets the road because there's a good, you know, there's how you define a service, then at the end of the day is actually the implementation. And then um, phase three is the response phase where now you actually execute um, and can then provide the service to the constituents as identified. So, um, just um, the next slide is now the management phase, whether it can be long or short cycle, and in terms of um, how quickly you iterate to actually the provision of the service. So in terms of short cycle, you're continually improving the services that you're providing in terms of people, budget and systems. Then in terms of uh, long cycle is, uh, you know, looking at it in the long-term view and uh, continually providing the strategic support required uh, for the service to be available uh, to the constituents that you have selected or the stakeholders that you have selected as to provide that service. So, um, the next slide is the evaluation process, as has been said, it's good to continually look back and at the services that you're offering, find out whether you're actually meeting the objectives of the organization, whether you're meeting the needs of your constituents. And therefore, as we have said, you know, you're looking at the service list, you have selected, come up with a catalog, you come up with a profile, and at the end of the day, you have a service portfolio. At the end of the day, you have to continually look at the gap analysis and identify whether there is need to introduce more services to fill in the gap or improve the services that you already have. Um, and then uh, moving on after the evaluation is basically now you have the whole framework implemented uh, for 
you know, as a CDC, as a cyber defense center. So this is, uh, I believe, uh, the last slide. And what we have done on the basis of uh, this framework is um, then developed a survey. And the survey, I will post the link to in the chat box. And the survey is looking at all, uh, you know, basically as we have gone through all the services and asking C CISOs, CSOs, um, you know, the team, the committee, which is providing security services, um, how, how they have implemented, whether they have implemented, you know, looked at the service list, gone to the service um, catalog profile and developed indeed a, a service profile, where they are at, it, whether they're insourcing, outsourcing, or, you know, have not assigned, um, or they're planning to or are providing. So with that information gathered um, under ITUT, then we can look at opportunities as we have discussed earlier in the earlier panel for capacity development also international collaboration or regional co collaboration to improve uh, the cyber defense uh, centers in africa indeed the framework is you know for implementation whether nationally i mean sorry globally it's a it's a international standard uh, but to begin with we are looking at implementation in africa and then the survey will then be extended as required to other the regions. So um, I believe that is it from me. And if you have any questions, then you can let me know. So um, before you is uh, the editors of uh, the X1060 and probably known to most of you, but have been very supportive of the regional group for Africa in implementing the, the recommendations. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I'm available. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. What a great panel that we just had. Um, we are out of time. We won't be able to uh, take questions, but feel free to send your question by, by writing or in the chat, and we will uh, provide response to, to those different questions. Uh, having said that, I would like to thank you very much, uh, all of you uh, participants, but also uh, speakers for this great panel. Uh, I'm handing over to Chris. Chris, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jean-Robert. That, that was really interesting. I, I am a big fan of frameworks. Um, back when I ran or, or started building the CERT UK, we looked at all the things we could do and we did that through a sort of a framework session. And we looked at, I think, some 40 or 44 different things, services we could offer. And we, we nailed it down to four or five. And I'm a big fan of really understanding what you do and understanding how to do it. And then making sure that you do that really, really, really well. It's much better to do a few small focused things that your, 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 the people you work for, your stakeholders have decided are important and that you do those really well rather than trying to do everything because that's really, really difficult. So big fan, big fan of, I mean, the P certain the differences between a product security team and an ordinary, ordinary, I use it in inverted commas, computer security team versus the the sector ISACs or CSERT sector certs which I've worked with many for many time, times in my life really important again and then finally joining that all together and the sim3 maturity model I think is an absolutely is just a, an, an outstanding way of moving forward measuring maturity and measuring your ability your, and your ability to measure that as you improve or or if worth thing happens deeper but you can measure that and actually have a good understanding so I'm a huge huge fan of that as said, all of those things feed directly into what we'd call our second second mission statement of common language, common understanding, common common knowledge of what is good and so on. So that's really important.